go ahead and get started now. Uh, welcome again, everybody. Thanks for joining us today, this evening. Um, I'm Brooke Lovelace. I'm the Executive Director of the Iowa Developmental Disabilities Council. And the DD Council is proud to partner with our State Treasurer's Office to promote the iABLE accounts and provide some education on how they work. Uh, the iABLE accounts are a great way for people with disabilities to obtain and maintain some independence. And our DD Council is all about helping people do that. Um, if you're not familiar um, with the DD Council, our website and contact information will be given at the end of our presentation. But we do want to spend our time together today um, to learn more about the iABLE account and some recent changes. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things before we get started. Um, there is closed captioning um, and there's a button there on the bottom that says live transcript that I think you can press to get closed captioning going. We also have an interpreter that hopefully is pinned for you to be able to see. Um, everybody during the webinar, um, besides the speakers, will be on mute, um, but there will be time to answer questions at the end of the presentation. Um, so please feel free to enter your questions at any time during the presentation um, and just use the chat function or the chat tab that's there on the bottom of the screen to enter in your questions, and then we will get to those at the end. Um, I think now um, we're going to uh, first start off with a poll question real quick. There we go. So if you could just take a minute to, to fill out the poll question and we will um, share those results here um, during the presentation. So we've got a few more people already wanting to answer here. Looks like we've stopped with that. So now I would like to turn it over to our state treasurer, Mike Fitzgerald, who's going to um, say a few words for us um, to kick us off. Well, thank you, thank you Brooke. And uh, I wanna thank you for the fine job that uh, you have done and for the Iowa DD Council, all the good things that you're doing. So uh, thank you and thank you for partnering with, with us for this webinar tonight, which, which is really important to let people know about this very valuable program. And you know, this program has been in existence for five years now. And the more people hear about it, the more they're signing up, the more feedback we get about how it's helpful. As a matter of fact, we now have 1,500 accounts. We have <clears throat> over $13 million invested in pro this program. But we know there's a lot more Iowans with disabilities that we can help. And this program is a top priority in the treasurer's office. We spend a lot of time and effort because we can see the good things that it's doing, helping Iowans out there uh, achieve a better life experience. And that's what this uh, program is all about. And, you know, we know a lot of, we've heard from a lot of you that there have been barriers. And we've worked, our office has worked, and uh, a lot of folks have worked to bring down some of those barriers. And that's what this webinar is about uh, tonight, to explain how easy or easier this program is uh, to be involved with. And that, uh, the person that's the real expert is the chief of staff in the treasurer's office, and that's Karen Austin. And she'll be going through a lot of those changes. And also uh, later, Alicia Callanan will be answering some of these questions as well. So we've put a lot of work into it. I just can't tell you how appreciative I am of all of the you Iowans turning in. And Hopefully we can answer all your questions and get a lot more people signed up for this great program. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to the Chief of Staff in the Treasurer's Office, Karen Austin. Thank you, Mike, really appreciate that. Um, I just wanna do a real quick, um, we had trouble with my audio earlier, so I just wanna make sure, Brooke, can you hear me okay? Sorry, you probably can't see me, yes. Okay, you, you yes, okay, good, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, sorry, and you can see my screen, right? 
Yes, you're okay. good to go. Thank you. Sorry, I'm having some uh, video issues here. So thank you very much. We really appreciate everybody's participation today. Um, we are, just like Mike said, we are excited about being able to share with you some of the great changes that have been made to the program um, in, the, in the last um, few months. So uh, the first thing we wanna do though is uh, share the poll um, results with everyone. And I can't see the screen. So I assume that they're up on the screen. Um, it looks like we've got a great mix today of, um, you know, a lot of people that are somehow familiar with it between slightly, somewhat, and moderately, um, and then some new people uh, that are, are new to it. So appreciate, um, appreciate every perspective, and we'll try to cover the bases um, on, on today's presentation. So what we're going to do today, our agenda is um, just going to do a quick review of the timeline, how, how ABLE came to be. Uh, talk specifically about the IABLE program and then answer any questions um, at the end. So we're here to provide whatever information folks need. Just to give a little bit of background, uh, the federal government created uh, the ABLE, they, the ABLE Act was passed in 2014. Um, that enabled states to start their own programs. Iowa was one of the first states to jump right on that. So in uh, the spring of 2015, Iowa's version of the bill was signed into law. I always like to point out that it was done unanimously in both the House and the Senate and signed by the governor. So this truly is a bipartisan program and a bipartisan effort. Uh, here in Iowa. In 2017, it took us a couple years to get the program up and running. There was a lot of uh, work going on behind the scenes. We launched iABLE. Mike had mentioned earlier that, uh, that we launched five years ago, and we've come a long way since then. So we're really excited to be able to share uh, about the program. In 2020, it was really pretty obvious. We work with um, different uh, states uh, around the country um, on what we could do to make these programs better overall. And the great thing was in 2020, final federal regulations were published that helped to clarify um, and what we believe make things easier and break some of those ba barriers that Treasurer Fitzgerald was talking about. In response to that in 2021, again, Iowa was one of the first states to jump on um, and say, let's get these changes implemented. So we were really excited to have House File 853. I'll talk more about that as we move through the presentation, but the great things that that bill did. Once again, it went through both chambers unanimously and was signed by the governor. I'm going to um, share a video because this video really tells the story of ABLE. I'm going to give one disclaimer. There's a number that's wrong in there that I'll share with you um, afterwards what's wrong um, with, or it's an updated number. It's a number that has changed, um, but it's a, it's a compelling video that was done as a collaborative uh, process with um, different programs statewide or nationwide. As someone who has a son with Down syndrome, this law was one of the best things that's happened to the disability community in a very long time. In 2014, Congress passed the ABLE Act to help families with disabilities save for life. The ABLE Act is a game changer for Americans living with disabilities, but there's a problem. Only 50,000 Americans are currently using ABLE accounts to save and more than 14 million are eligible. An ABLE account is a savings plan that people with disabilities or their families can use to save for someone with a disability the same way that people can save for someone without a disability. Ethan has needed extensive dental work, which has cost thousands and thousands of dollars. You can go down the list and pretty much every part of his life took on an added, added expense. ABLE allows people with disabilities to put money away that they can use in the future to cover essential life costs. Without the risk of losing government disability benefits, we save for Audrey through an ABLE account the same way that we save for my other daughter with a 529 college plan. Before ABLE, people with disabilities who depended upon government benefits to cover the high cost of living with a disability couldn't have savings of more than $2,000 without risk of losing their benefits. Nobody can live off $2,000. 
This limitation made it extremely difficult for many people with disabilities to live independently. Do you want to be in a place where you can live all by yourself and do all the things that you want to do in your dreams? Yes. With ABLE, you can save without losing SSI, Medicaid, HUD, and other important benefits. ABLE allows you to set aside up to $15,000 each year. If there's one thing you need to know about the ABLE account, it's that your money grows tax-free. But the difference is that you can use it at any time to pay for any eligible disability-related expense. My favorite thing about ABLE is that it is flexible and simple. That I just go and sign up on the website and it's done and I'm saving. Stable. Dependable. Capable. Enable. Available. We need your help to spread the word on ABLE. All right, that's that's one video that we love to share um, that some of the limits have increased since then and obviously the numbers in the programs have increased but that really shows the um, nationwide effort uh, to to really grow these programs and help as many people as we can uh, for the RI able program. Uh, this was mentioned earlier but. Uh, Treasurer Fitzgerald developed an inexpensive plan that's easy to understand and is user friendly. That's what was really important to us. We wanted to make it easy. Um, right now, the average account size is just over or just about $9,000. We have over $13 million in assets and over 1,500 accounts. So, what is iABLE? iABLE allows an eligible person, and we'll talk about eligibility. Uh, with a disability and their families, their support system. It allows them to save for qualified disability related expenses, earn tax breaks that are similar to, you know, people in Iowa have heard of College Savings Iowa in the video, they mentioned 529 plans. You know, families have been able to save for years for college. Uh, this allows persons with disabilities and their support systems to be able to, to earn those same tax breaks. Um, and then the most important piece of this is you can save money and protect your eligibility for assistance programs such as Social Security uh, benefits and Medicaid. So we talked about how what is that eligibility. There's two criteria that must be met to qualify for an IABLE account. So the disability um, needs to have been present before the age of 26. I'm just going to throw out there very quickly, and I'll probably come back to this um, later on. There is a national effort right now in what is called the uh, Age Adjustment Act um, at the federal level to get that age raised to 46. But current, current state, the disability had to have been present at the age of 26. Um, and then at least one of the following needs to be true. You need to, if you're eligible for supplemental uh, security income, so SSI or SSDI, then you've, you've taken care of that second one. Um, otherwise, you can self-certify that you have a similarly severe disability um, that's included in the list of the SSA's list of compassionate allowance conditions, um, which is available on the, the federal website. So what is so what you know I said that probably the most important piece of this program is allowing people to maintain benefits that was really stressed in the video that we watched. Um, so the first $100,000 saved in an IABLE account is disregarded from SSI eligibility. Um, so anything over $100,000 is not it, it's not it's not considered um, housing expenses there is a kind of a special little glitch with housing expenses. They're not treated as a resource as long as they're withdrawn in the month that they are used. So we do encourage people to make sure you read the information about that um, so, that, so that there's not a glitch on that. Um, IABLE does report account balances monthly to the Social Security Administration. We're required to do that as a qualified ABLE program. And then Social Security and SSI monthly benefits payments can be directly deposited into ABLE accounts. And that was an exciting uh, ruling when that came out to know that those checks can be just automatically put into an IABLE account if that's what somebody chooses to do. Some of the uh, additional programs that disregard ABLE assets, again, it was mentioned in the video, but um, HUD 
Uh, the FAFSA um, does not consider ABLE assets when, when considering uh, higher education uh, eligibility for scholarship or Pell Grants. Uh, the SNAP, the Supplemental Nutritional Programs, and Medicaid, um, all of those disregard. This is a commitment, not just at the state level, but at the federal level. Um, really, the point is to say, we want to give people the opportunity to save over that $2,000 um, limit right now. So they have federal programs, uh, basically all of them are saying, we're not gonna, we're not gonna look at ABLE assets. One of the things um, that has always been a concern with some people is how Medicaid recapture um, works with the ABLE program. So prior to House File 835, I mentioned that that passed last legislative session, so in, in 21, um, Medicaid could recapture funds from an IABLE account. Under the new law, most recapture is not allowed. I have to say most because there are circumstances in which federal law requires the um, ABLE um, Medicaid to recapture. And you know we've listed what those are. Um, the account owner has received Medicaid at the age of 55 or older uh, or the long-term um, services and supports. Again, we would encourage people to read the information about that. We just wanted to give that information. Um, one thing to make sure uh, that you do understand though when it comes to Medicaid recapture is qualified disability related expenses, including burial and funeral expenses are paid before recapture. So if there are outstanding expenses um, that, are, that need to be made, that comes out before any recapture and again, due to House File 835, those recapture um, circumstances have been reduced. Uh, we do, again, uh, encourage everyone to consult the plan program description um, or your income maintenance uh, worker with Medicaid uh, for more information on that. So I wanna talk a little bit about who can open an account. This is where ABLE gets a little more complex than maybe uh, you know, a College Savings Iowa account. So if the eligible individual, so the individual with the disability, if they are under the age of 18, um, in that case, a parent or an individual with financial authority um, may open an account on behalf of the eligible individual. Uh, no documentation is required. That's one of the great things that has changed uh, here with these, these, the federal regulation change as well as uh, the change here in Iowa. So no documentation is required. Um, up until last, in last, you know, in the last year, we did require documentation of some types starting March 31st. Uh, that documentation is not required. Now, if the eligible individual is over the age of 18, there's kind of two scenarios um, that, that may apply. One is the situation in which the eligible individual, the person with a disability, has legal capacity. Um, in that case, if they have the ability to make their own financial decisions legally, uh, then they can open the account on their own. Um, and if they choose, they can grant someone else access to act on that account um, with them so they can have a parent on there as well. If they, do, if they lack legal capacity, they don't have the ability to make those financial decisions on their own, um, then an authorized individual is going to be able to open and manage that account on their behalf. And maybe one of the best things that happened here recently with ABLE plans was the federal government, when they when they released their federal regulations, they actually established a hierarchy. So this um, has gone into effect in Iowa here. We put it in place um, on March 31st. So this is, this is new, um, but an authorized individual must certify under penalty of perjury that no other person with a higher priority is willing or able to act um, as the authorized individual. And willing or able is, is a key a key phrase there. Um, and if that changes, that, then that they would you know, let the program know. But the order um, that that works in is, you know, if there is a power of attorney, they are the first one that has that, that ability to open the account. And then it moves from there to a conservator, a spouse, a parent, a sibling, grandparent, 
um, or a RET payee appointed by the Social Security Administration. Again, one of the changes when we went to this new system in um, March on March 31st, no documentation is required unless we request it. If we have a question, if somebody questions whether or not somebody has the authority, um, then obviously we'd ask for some documentation. Um, but again, this hierarchy is set by um, the federal government. And you know, for anybody to open the account, they have to certify that anybody above them on that hierarchy is not willing or able to act as the authorized individual. We're gonna stop right now and do another poll question. Uh, this one's gonna be easy, true or false. Uh, and this will, you can decide whether it's a test of whether or not I, I did a good job in the presentation or um, if you did a good job of listening, we'll say it's a test on me. But um, the eligible individual is always the account over owner, even when someone opens the account on their behalf. So we'll give that just a minute. It looks like we got a lot of people answering that question. All right, we'll just give it one more minute or a few more seconds. It's look like we've got over 100 people that have answered it so far. So that's fabulous. So we'll go ahead and end the poll. It looks like it's slowing down a little bit. So apologies if anybody wanted to answer. Um, and then we can share the results. So it looks like 84% uh, um, of you answered true and 16% answered uh, false. The answer is true. The eligible individual is always the account owner, which is very different than we think about, like if we compare it to college savings, library, which we try not to, um, because there's a lot of differences. There are some similarities, but um, the account owner, and it seems, um, odd that a, a three-year-old can actually be an account owner. That's why they need a parent or somebody with financial authority um, that would be the authorized individual, but they would always be the owner. All right, so we can stop sharing on that one and we'll move to the next uh, section. So we're going to talk a little bit about um, the investing. So when you when you open an ABLE account, when you open an iABLE account, you can open it with as little as $25. That's a really exciting thing. We wanted to make sure when we started this program that we made it easy for people uh, to open an account. First barrier could be you need to have $5,000 to open the account. Um, we did not want any of those barriers. So with as little as $25, you have six investment options to choose from. They range from you know, aggressive things that are more in the stock market to conservative things that are more in the bond market. And there's a few options in the middle that lets you mix those. So when you think about it, you think about when am I gonna need this money and what is my risk tolerance? Um, and for some people that haven't ever invested, that can kind of be a big decision. We've got resources available on our website and in our program material to kind of help people understand their risk tolerance and their um, kind of what they're saving for, whether you're saving long term or short term. There's also an FDIC insured checking account option, which does include a debit card and optional checks if you um, want the ability to write a check. Uh, and then you can either choose one of those options or you can blend all seven. So, you know, if you say, I want to put some of it into the checking account, but I want to invest some because I'm saving for something down the road, you have the ability to do that. So we want to make sure you understand the, the fees. Um, it is an inexpensive program when you really compare it to a banking or investing type of vehicle. So there is a $5 fee monthly for account maintenance. Um, that is discounted by $1.25 if you elect for e-delivery. That's just simply because it costs money to print and mail statements. There's also a $2 a month um, monthly service charge for the checking account option, which is waived um, if you have an account average daily balance in that checking account of over 250, not all of the um, options, but just the checking account, or if you're enrolled in electronic statement delivery um, with Fifth Third, which Fifth Third is the uh, bank that does the, the checking account. Uh, 
there are some uh, relatively small uh, asset-based fees on the um, investment options as well. So let's talk about contributions and qualified expenses, because that's where a lot of our questions come in. How much can I save and um, how can I spend it? So when we look at the contribution sources, the account owner, which we've established is the eligible individual, so the person with the disability, um, they can contribute. A parent or anybody else in the family, grandma, grandpa, anybody else can roll over. So if somebody had started saving in a 529 plan like College Savings Iowa, they would have the ability to roll that over into um, the an ABLE account. Um, that is subject to the, the income, the restrictions that we're going to talk about on the next slide. And then family and friends, anybody can make a contribution to your account because, you know, that's the great, it's kind of crowdsourcing your ABLE account. So, so the limit amounts, uh, 16,000, the video that we watched earlier, it, it indicated that that limit was 15,000. Um, great news when, when that amount goes up. Uh, so now the amount is 16,000. So that's the federal annual contribution limit. Um, and that does include the rollovers from the 529 plan. Again, you can open up an account with as little as $25. Um, and then the balances, and this was in that earlier video as well, the balances can't exceed $100,000. Um, so that is one of the things it's, it would take you a while to get to that hundred thousand, unless we, you know, experience a great, um, market that includes the income if you're in one of the investment accounts. Um, but, but it's 16,000 a year. Now, if you need to roll over money, maybe you have 20,000 in a 529 plan, it'd just take you two years to get that rolled over, um, into the ABLE plan if you wanted to put all of that into ABLE. The great thing that the, and again, this comes from the federal um, the standpoint, but one of the great things they did was want to recognize that, that when people are working, they should be able to save more. Um, so that $16,000 limit that we talked about, you can actually um, contribute more than that if part of that it comes from work. So it's based on um, a a number provided by the federal government. In 2021, that number was $12,880. So you can put up to $12,880. That's up to, if you, if, if you put less than that in, that's fine, can come from work. And then the other 16,000 can come from some of those other sources we talked about. All right, I'm gonna pause right there and throw up another, we'll throw up another uh, poll question. Uh, to talk about uh, the contributions. So only a, the account owner's contributions count towards the federal annual contribution limit. So true or false, um, whether or not the account owner's contributions count are the only ones that count towards the federal annual contribution limit. All right, looks like we've got people answering really quickly. We're getting up there. Um, we'll give it one more minute. Probably not a full minute. We'll give it a few more seconds here to, to answer. All right, we've got about 75% of the folks that have answered. So we'll go ahead and share those results. Um, so uh, false is what the majority of the people, 91% of the folks said false. And that is, that is correct. I was going to say that's true, but that gets very confusing to say false is true. Only the account, I'm sorry, it's false that only the account owner's contributions count towards the federal annual contribution limit. When, when we're looking at how much you can put in, that's the, that's the limit of all of the contributions added together. All right. So one of the biggest questions we always get is, well, what can I use the money for? And as I approach this slide, I'm going to go to the really small print down there at the bottom that says the treasurer's office cannot provide tax or legal advice related to qualified disability expenses. So what I'm going to really do is tell you about the umbrellas um, that expenses can fall under and the intent behind the law. Um, but we can't necessarily say, yes, that's a valid expense or no, that's not a valid expense. Um, a qualified disability expense is related to the account owner that is related to the account owner's blindness or disability. And 
benefits them in maintaining or improving the health, independence, or quality of life. Now, you might read that and say, well, gosh, that's really vague. And I think one of the greatest things we think about these programs is, yes, that is vague. That is intentionally vague because what will improve um, or help maintain the health, independence, and quality of life of one person is not the same for another person. So the idea behind this program was to truly say, if a person with a disability is allowed to save, we want them to be able to save for anything that is going to make their life better, that is going to improve their health, independence, or quality of life. So things like education, assistive technology, transportation, housing, legal fees. In one of the earlier slides, we talked about, you know, um, different expenses related to uh, pre planning, maybe, um, um, you know, funeral expenses, those kind of things. I mean, it's anything that really is for the benefit of the individual. I'm sure we'll get a lot of questions on, um, we, we always anticipate that on the, the um, what we can use the, the funds for. I wanna talk briefly just about the tax benefits. Um, the federal government and the state government said we want to make, we want to give these equal footing to the 529 plans. People saving for college, um, let's give people um, who are saving for disability expenses the same tax benefits. So the savings grow federally tax deferred. You don't pay any taxes on it while it's invested. Um, qualified withdrawals are federally tax exempt. So if it meets the definition of a qualified withdrawal, you never pay taxes on any of that income that's earned as an, on an investment. And then you can roll those um, assets over from a 529 plan without penalty. So in a 529 plan, there's penalties if you don't use it for um, a uh, education related expense. In this case, they, they have eliminated that. Um, at the state uh, level, the state kind of doubled down and did exactly what they did for uh, 529 savings, um, just like College Savings Iowa. So the savings grows, state tax deferred. Again, you don't pay state taxes while it's invested. All withdrawals are state tax exempt. That's a little bit different than the federal. Um, and then there is a state tax deduction for any taxpayer contributing to an IABLE account. So I'm just going to say that again, any taxpayer contributing to an IABLE account. If you have a 529 plan, that's different. It, that, that tax benefit is for the owner of the account. This tax benefit is for anybody who contributes. In 2022, that Iowa tax um, deduction amount is $3,522. So I'm going to put a really confusing slide up to, to just try to demonstrate how we're going to mix a few of these numbers we've talked about. So we've got the um, $3,522 tax um, deduction amount for Iowans, and we've got that $16,000 federal maximum annual contribution limit. So if you look at the account owner here, um, the account owner can make contributions um, and any contributions that they make are going to be, if they are filing taxes, they can deduct from their state income tax. So in this example, the account owner put in $2,000. Let's say the account owner had a friend who said, I just, I, I want to contribute $1,500 for your um, birthday. If that friend lives in the state of Iowa and pays Iowa income taxes, they can deduct that $1,500. Um, and then grandma wants to give $3,500 because you're the best grandkid she has. So um, she can also deduct that $3,500. But mom is contributing $9,000. She can contribute that $9,000, but the most she can deduct from her taxes is that $3,522. Now, in total, what all of those people contribute to the account that's where that $16,000 maximum comes in. And just a reminder, if that account owner works, they can actually increase that by up to just over $12,000. All right, I'm gonna, I've got two more slides to summarize and then we're gonna hit your questions. So just a reminder, um, if you have questions and you haven't put them in the chat, go ahead. Now's a good time to start thinking about getting those in the chat. Um, just wanna highlight some of the things we've talked about. Um, this program lets you save above the income limits for SSI and Medicaid. That's the really the biggest purpose behind these ABLE accounts. 
Um, there is no documentation required to open an account. That's a change. So for anybody who may have tried to open an account six months ago, that's a change in, the, in how we do the accounts. Um, you can open with as little as $25, and we always encourage you to involve family and friends and saving towards financial goals. We have the seven investment options. Um, so we, we feel like it's designed to meet both long-term and short-term savings goals. And then again, Iowa taxpayers can deduct um, up to $35.22 from their state income taxes. So if you're excited about this and say, I want to get going right now, how do I do that? Um, the first thing I'm always going to tell you, because I have to do this, um, is to say you got to read our program description. Um, the second thing we encourage you to do before you actually go online to enroll is to is to look at the investment options. We have those out on our website, but that's a good thing to know because you will have to make a decision on how you want the money, where you want the money invested. Um, and then you need to gather all the account owner's information. So if you are the account owner, you likely know all this information, name, birth date, address, um, disability type. That's something you might want to um, make sure you, you go on and look at what those are. And then the social security number. Um, if an authorized individual is opening the account on behalf of the account owner, then again, we're going to need your name, birth date, address, social security number, all of those important pieces. Um, so to be able to enroll, just visit iable.gov and click the enroll button um, in the top right hand corner uh, and we'll be ready to go. We're going to throw up one more poll question um, for folks. Uh, and this is more just for us. So we're going to throw it up there of the topics in this webinar today. Which one did you learn the most about? Um, but we're also then going to go ahead and uh, talk a little bit about um, the questions that you guys have. Uh, that's what's really important to us is to make sure that we can answer your questions. Uh, so we'll go ahead and um, start. As um, Treasurer Fitzgerald said at the beginning, um, I will answer some of the questions. And then Alicia Callanan with our office, um, she is our consumer programs director, and she uh, is very much involved in this program and answers a lot of the day-to-day -day questions. So we'll tag team any of those answers um, to make sure that we get them for you. And I think Brooke was going to, I might go back to some slides, but Brooke was going to uh, kind of manage the questions coming in through the chat. Yes, yes. Are you ready to, to start with those then, Karen? We are ready. Okay, okay. The first one came from somebody that's on, but actually sent it ahead of time. And they want to know if anybody can make deposits and transactions out of the accounts. So hopefully um, that question wouldn't have had to been asked if they were, if I know that wasn't ahead of one, but anybody can make contributions. We talked about that contribution limit. In terms of any kind of transfers, you do have to either be the account owner or you have to be um, an authorized individual. You have to be somebody with authority to be able to do that. And, and there's more information um, about that specifically in our program material. Great. And then the next question that we have is that what can you talk a little bit about why it would be a benefit to open one of these instead of a special needs trust fund? Well, I will I will do my best. I'm going to put a little asterisk before this discussion, though, and say again, I can't give tax or legal advice. Um, but what we have found with people is some people actually have both. It really kind of depends on your own personal needs. The nice thing about iABLE is, you know, if you have under $16,000, or again, um, if you're, you have income from work, that, that increases that. But if you have under $16,000 um, in any given year that you want to contribute, um, iABLE is, you know, the, the, there's, there's a lot of great benefits. It's easy to open the account. It's easy to manage the account. Um, you don't have to go through the court system. Um, there's not, you know, any kind of special reporting. But I think what we would say is, you know, if, if you are in a situation where a special needs um, trust might make sense, we would encourage you to talk with your, um, you know, whoever you get legal advice from, because there could be some circumstances, you know, if it's a large sum of money, obviously that, you know, that, that $16,000 limit. But again, we find that some people have both. 
um, and they find ways to, to, to use them for different purposes. Maybe the ABLE program is that shorter term. Again, we've got, we've got the income limits there that may not apply to the special needs trust. Karen, yep. I don't know if you mentioned this too, that you can transfer from the special needs trust to high ABLE. Um, so that's sometimes what people will do for those day-to-day -day expenses if they have more than 16,000. That is a very good point. Yes, that was actually um, uh, one of the things that the legislature clarified last year when they passed um, House File 835. And I, I think, Karen, that you did discuss this, but just to confirm, people can transfer a college savings a 529 fund to a IABLE account. Yes, they can. Um, and again, that is subject to that $16,000 limit. So um, if there's other things that went into the ABLE account, um, even if they, let's say they had $10,000 in the 529, but they had already, you know, there'd already been contributions of $10,000 made into the ABLE account, they could transfer $6,000 this year, and then next year they could transfer more. So you just, it still has to abide by the $16,000 limit, but but eventually there's no limit to how much could transfer, obviously the 100,000 limit. Uh, and Karen, it does sunset and currently at the end of that. 2025. Yes. So That's right. The, We're going to try to fix that, right? <laughs> yes, the federal government currently has a limit set that as uh, after December 31st of 2025, you won't be able to transfer from the 529 to the ABLE, but we're hoping that they will extend that and it will be able to be on, but that would just be something to check if you get closer to that date. Great. Thanks, guys. Um, so this is a good question as we're getting into graduation um, season. And so for our high school graduates out there, are they able to transfer and deposit the money that they receive um, for gifts from graduation into their IABLE account without it affecting their waiver services. Yes. So any they can they can happen one of two ways. Again, if that's an Iowa taxpayer, that that individual grandma, if she's an Iowa taxpayer, might prefer to just put the money into ABLE directly. Um, but if you know, if, if they have a graduation party and they get $200, they can put that money into the ABLE program. And you may have covered this too, but just to confirm, is a tombstone for a grave an approved expense? Well, I'm going to caveat that with um, uh, the fact that, I, again, I'm going to say that you cannot, uh, I cannot give tax or legal advice, um, but, uh, you know, if that is a valid um, uh, funeral or burial expense, then, then funeral and burial expenses are allowed um, under that, under the law. And is there a beneficiary that can be designated on the account? Um, I'm going to, you know, Alicia, I'll take that and then, and then jump in uh, with, with some of the federal regulations that are going into effect um, in November. There's, there is going to be the opportunity to name a beneficiary, but it's a very limited, um, I'm sorry, that's not a beneficiary. Uh, that would be a successor participant mm -hmm. that would be limited to a sibling um, of the individual. In terms of beneficiary, there is no opportunity in a five, in a, sorry, in an ABLE program to name a beneficiary. Alicia, I'll let you fact check me on that one. Nope, you handled it well. <laughs> okay, and then just to confirm that the $1,000 limit includes only contributions, do earnings have any impact? The, the $16,000 limit? No, they, this is the 10,000. So I assume oh, that all that includes earnings and contributions. But the $10,000 is for, or can you go over the, I'm sorry, the 100,000. Sorry, I'm okay. Sorry, 100,000. Okay, sorry. <laughs> I'm reading I was, my I numbers wrong. To, I was trying to figure out when I said 10,000. Okay. 100,000. Um, so in the 100,000, that is the account balance limit. So um, that would, if the, if the market would to, take that over the 100,000, you would not be able to put additional contributions in. And I know this is a popular question that we continue to get to. Um, and and you, you mentioned this a little bit, but it's come up again. If a member does die, does the money go back to the state? So um, I want to just make sure that, and maybe I'll go back to that slide, just so, just so that we are clear, because this is something that changed in um, in 2021, the legislature passed um, a uh, 
passed uh, a law that that talked directly to Medicaid recapture. So um, prior to um, House File 835, Medicaid could recapture any funds from an IABLE account. After that law passed, well, effective June 1st of last year, I'm sorry, July 1st of last year, um, most recapture is not allowed. There is that one circumstance under federal law or that set of circumstances under federal law that, that the state Medicaid is required by federal law to recapture. Um, so it would be subject to that, but it really does eliminate most of the recapture. Um, that really when you when you think about accounts that um, were designed for people whose disability started uh, prior to the age of 26. Um, so that hopefully that is clear that there was a change in Iowa law last year. I believe this is referring to eligibility, but what are the alternatives for individuals diagnosed and determined disabled after age 26? If the diagnosis is made after age 26, they are not eligible today um, to, uh, to open an ABLE account. Uh, again, it goes with when the disability, well, I'm sorry, the onset of the disability. So, you know, we're not going to argue that. That's going to be up to, um, you know, how to argue when the onset of that disability. So a little bit of finesse there between diagnosed and the onset. Um, but if they are over the age of 26, let's say somebody, um, a veteran, uh, that's one of the best examples. That's why they want to raise the limit. We want to raise the limit to 46, because if you are injured, um, become disabled after the age of 26, right now you are not eligible for an ABLE account. So we would encourage everybody to reach out to, um, you know, their federal representatives um, and senators and, and encourage support of the ABLE Age Adjustment Act. Great. Okay, um, our HCBS waiver case manager said that we need to report to the state when we open an IABLE account. Is that true and how do we do that? Alicia, do you know? I don't, I, I think we, I'm not sure on that. To my knowledge, that wasn't a requirement, but I would recommend checking with a legal professional. I mean, I don't, I don't think that there's any requirement. Again, we can't give tax or legal advice, any requirement to disclose that. I mean, one of the, one of the benefits, the information is going to go monthly to the SSI. That's, that's a requirement as from us. So I don't, I, I, again, I would, as Alicia said, we need to defer that. Um, But you can certainly reach out to us if you have a specific question on that. And is there a fee to manage the account and does the money draw interest? So when we looked at the, and I gotta figure out which, um, which direction to go. Um, you know, we talked a little bit about uh, there's six investment options and then there's one checking um, account option. That checking account option is FDIC insured and um, essentially does not earn interest. I think it's like 0.001%. Um, percent. The investment options are invested in, um, uh, we have Vanguard, BlackRock, some of the major investment firms, um, they are invested. Um, and again, in terms of fees, there's an account maintenance fee. So that's just for us to be able to, to pay our record keeper. Um, but then that the third bullet here, we talked about um, that the, the options also have additional asset-based fees. They are incredibly low, um, you know, compared to if you wanted to go invest um, directly. But there are some fees, and those are all set out on our website as well as in our program material. They're, they depend a little bit on whether or not you're in. Um, it depends on what you're invested in. So it's not one, one all-in cost. We talk about a one all-in cost with uh, College Savings Iowa. It's a little bit different with this plan. Okay. Uh, when I first created an, an ABLE account, I opened an account for my daughter as her legal guardian, um, but because I was the one who opened the account, I was told we only had one account option, which didn't seem as attractive as some of the other options. Who could I visit with about whether or not there are more options available to us now? I assume we're talking about investment options, and I'm I'm not 100% sure why. Um, there, the... Um, there, there were some early on with the program 
um, some questions about who could actually have a debit card. Um, so that ability to, um, if there was joint um, uh, guardians or conservators. Um, but Alicia, I'm not aware of any reason why um, you would be limited as a, as, a, as a parent on how you would be able to invest the funds. I'm not either. No. Okay, so I would encourage you to reach out to our toll-free number or send an email to the program, um, you know, because that, that is something we'd want to get cleared up. Okay, next question. Um, when I send a check to IABLE, it takes quite a while uh, before it is added to the fifth third bank checking account. Why do I not see that sooner in that account? So I will, I will do my best to just kind of explain how the process works and let Alicia jump in. Um, but as you can imagine, we have, um, we have a record keeper that, that you send those checks to. Um, and the money has to process through them and then go to the bank because under the, the rules of an ABLE account, we can't directly invest that. It has to be invested through the trust. So that money has to pass through the trust. I would guess that that's, that's why there's a little bit of a delay. I don't know, Alicia, if you have anything additional. Uh, no, that I, I would say that is. I, you can get money a little quicker if you do an online if, um, transfer from your bank if you have a bank account over instead of uh, saying the check-in. So that sometimes will be a little bit quicker, but Karen did outline some of the process. Okay, um, instead of work income, can the deposits be from a child support? Um, for the additional? I, I'm, yeah, go ahead, Alicia. Oh, sorry, I was just gonna say, is that for the additional um, able to work, I assume? Or I will answer the question, I guess, that it is for the additional. Um, it doesn't work. state, but yeah, I, I, I guess that's what is, is, is child support and would that be considered contribution or work income? It would be considered in that 16,000 okay. um, contribution. Okay. Um, if a person does go to work and work so much, they eventually become ineligible for SSI um, and not 16, 19B eligible and, and social security disability. Are they no longer allowed to have an IABLE account? If you no longer meet the the qualifications of an ABLE account, I don't know how quickly I can get back to that screen, but but simply the fact that you um, are eligible, sorry, I went too far, that you are eligible for um, SSI, that's one of when we talked about the disability had to be present before the age of 26, and then you have to meet at least one of the following. Um, so eligibility for SSI, that's kind of like the easy, the easy button, right? Um, you know, if you, if you qualify for that, you know you qualify. Um, but but you can also, if you have, I mean, if you have that disability and for whatever reason you're not, maybe you're eligible for SSI, but you actually haven't, um, you actually haven't requested it. If you have that disability and you have, and you self-certify that you have a similarly severe disability, then you are still age eligible for the ABLE program. Okay. Um, and then are the dividends or the capital gains that are gained in the account, those are, are those counted as SSI income? Um, I'm, Alicia, I'm not going to be able to answer that one. I don't know if you are or not. Can you repeat it for me, Brock? I just want to make sure I'm understanding. Let me, I'm sorry, I scrolled past. I think it's, it. it's if the income that comes in, so if, if the so account like the made interest money, paid. if the interest, the income earned on the account, is that, is that reportable as, it, um, apologies, Brooke, I don't know if you found that. Uh, no, yeah, I, no, it, our dividends and capital gains counted for SSI as income. Not if you used it for a qualified expense under my understanding. No, I, I think. That's a question about whether or not it's considered income for SSI though. I, I don't, I think we need to get back on that one. Okay. okay. And then um, next question, what does Medicaid recapture actually mean? So um, if, if you, I'm, I'm not gonna, if there are folks from, uh, <laughs> from the Department of Human Services on. I, my apologies if I don't uh, say this um, 
as eloquently as, as could be said, but um, if, if you have received Medicaid benefits um, over the course of your life, um, then Medicaid is able to recapture those, um, any, any money that you would have at the end of your life um, to reimburse, essentially to reimburse um, for that, for those um, expenses that were paid. So Medicaid recapture is, is when you, um, when they come back and say, okay, Medicaid expenses were paid. Um, now, um, upon death, there could be some of that that is reimbursed back to um, the program. So it, in things outside of ABLE, those are handled differently versus how IABLE accounts are handled. IABLE is not subject to that Medicaid recapture. If you're not receiving Medicaid benefits, then it's, it's not applicable. Let me just put it that way. But if you are, then that's where it would um, come into play. Okay. Um, how does one claim the tax deduction? Does Iowa, does IABLE provide a tax form to all contributor, contributors? No, you do have to keep track of it yourself. Um, and then when you're completing your, your state income tax, so whether that's the individual with the disability, grandma, mom, whoever it is that made that contribution, you have to be able to, if you're ever questioned that, um, the state treasurer's office is not the body that, that does taxes, but the Iowa Department of Revenue, you know, if they ever did an audit, then you would need to be able to demonstrate that you made a payment to an ABLE account. But you self-report that on your taxes. In the old days, I would say it's line 24, um, but nowadays everything is a click. Um, so uh, when you're filing your taxes, there is actually, I know, um, at least with TurboTax and some of those other softwares, um, they actually specifically ask if you um, made a contribution to an IABLE program um, in generally any uh, CPA that would be doing taxes would, would know to ask that question as well. But you'd want to make sure you let them know you made a contribution. Okay. Um, what if the beneficiary moves out of state and that might, they might be meaning the account owner then moves out of state? So one of, when, when the ABLE plan was the first year of his existence, so even before we launched our program, you had to open the account in, the state of res, in your state of residence. That was relatively med immediately lifted by the federal government within um, that first year. So um, there is no residency requirements um, to have an, an IABLE account. Um, your the tax benefits are related to, um, you know, only an Iowa taxpayer can get Iowa tax benefits. The same would be if you live in Illinois. Um, so most states, I don't want to say all states, do have an ABLE program. Um, uh, so, you know, we always encourage people, we think this is the best option for Iowans. Um, but if somebody were to move, they would have the option of keeping their IABLE account, um, or if there were some sort of benefit available to them, they might want to look at the state they moved to. And just um, for a matter of time, Karen, we are at six o'clock. We do have several questions we haven't gotten through yet. Do you have a little bit more time to stay on? I have time to stay on. I don't know, Alicia, if you do, but I'm certainly available. It's okay. Um, how is the checking account monitored uh, for authorized expenses? Actually, none, nothing is monitored for qualified <laughs> expenses. This is kind of how I said on the contributions, it's self-reporting. On the withdrawals, it's self-reported. So in terms of, you know, from us as the program, you know, the, the program managers that run the program, you know, we don't police whether that's a qualified or non-qualified disability related expense. If there is a concern that somebody might use a debit card or a check, um, you know, for non-qualified um, non expenses, then they may choose to not actually have those features um, available to them, but there is no policing inside of the program. It is definitely something that you want to have documentation on in the event that you would get audited, because that's the point at which you would have to demonstrate that those were qualified disability expenses. Okay. And then just to confirm, about 28000 is the max allowed if you have both contributions and um, earned income. 
correct. It's that 16,000 plus that 12,000. Oh. Yeah. Yep. That's, <laughs> that's yep. math. Yep. <laughs> yep. That's math. Yes. Now, just yep. as a reminder that that, that 12,000, you can't go over the 16,000. I mean, the 12,000 has to be from work. So they kind of work in tandem. Um, it's not like the total can be 28,000. There's two buckets there that you just have to make sure you're not going over the 16,000 in contributions and you're not going over the 12,800 in, um, in work income. Okay. So in total, you could put in the 28,000, um, uh, but it would have to, you would have to have that work income. Okay. Um, when filling out SNAP applications, HUD applications, do we report money in IABLE account? And yearly on our SSI reports, do we show IABLE money? Um, well, they are disregarded for the purposes, but in terms of answering the question of when you're filling out paperwork, I think I would have to defer back to the entity that, that you know, created that paperwork, um, but they they are disregarded in, in terms of your eligibility for the program, um, but I honestly can't answer whether or not they ask that question. Um, it cannot be used to determine whether or not you're eligible. Okay, and then uh, just to confirm, money put into this account um, can be used to help find, to pay for housing and apartment and to pay for college. Yes, those would be, I, again, I'm going to qualify that with, um, I'm not allowed to give tax or legal advice, but those are very specific examples of things that, that um, can be, um, the, the money can be used for. Okay. Um, then another uh, question here, a person tried to open an account a couple of years and, goes, and got stuck. Can that count that they've tried to open be deleted so we can try again without documentation? Alicia, I'm going to let you take that one. Yep, <laughs> I was going to say I can jump in. I would recommend reaching out to the plan. Um, they might be able to. I've seen some instances they can reopen it. Sometimes it's easier to just help, they'll work with you to open a new account. So I would recommend um, either sending us an email or giving us a call and our ABLE specialist can walk through with you. Okay. And then uh, let's see. Oh, can you explain the housing expense information again? Um, and I think this refers to, to your slide about. Um, yeah, uh, I think that yeah. was the, the special the special caveat there with yes. whether or not it's yes. considered an asset for um, SSI. Yeah. Um, so for the for SSI, um, the housing expenses are not treated as a resource if they are withdrawn in the month they are used. So, for example, um, if your rent is due. Um, on the first, you need to pull that money out on the first. You can't pull it out of your ABLE account on, um, you know, April uh, 29th. Um, that would not be within that same month. So it's kind of an unfortunate timing um, that it has to be a month because a lot of um, rent or those kind of things are due on the first, but they generally have, you know, that same leeway and you can actually and, and Alicia keep me honest here but you could set it up so that, that your account is paying that directly on the first of the month so there would be ways to make sure that you can get that done or it can be putting money into your um, a different uh, checking your savings account that you use to pay for um, your rent the key there is just making sure that, that they're withdrawn in the month that they are used okay um, and if the, uh, if the account manager becomes un, unable to continue to oversee the account for the account owner, can they transfer the management to somebody else? Well, they have to meet those qualifications of that hierarchy that we talked about. Um, so uh, it's not it's not quite as easy as just being able to name whoever whoever you want. If it was a parent that was um, that was managing the account previously, um, then then likely it could be the other parent um, or it's going to have to stay. They can't just say, I've got a good friend um, that I want to do it. In terms of the rep payee for SSI, it just has to be that nobody above them, again, is able or willing to um, act as the authorized individual, but they can't, they can't just name anybody they want. Sorry, I muted myself there. Um, okay, and then we will uh, be sharing uh, this presentation to everybody that's registered so that that uh, will be going out uh, in the next day or so. 
Um, is there one IABLE account that can be part savings and part checking? Yes, so you can only have one, um, one IABLE account, but you can invest that money in um, you know, a, a variety of different investments. And what, what a lot of times we might see is somebody wants to have that short-term money in a checking account. Um, it's kind of like having a checking and a savings account, but maybe they want to have um, you know, the rest of it invested in one of those investment options. And in fact, they can have it invested in two of those investment options. Maybe they're saving for something that's you know, 15 years down the road. Um, and they want that invested a little more aggressively, but then they're also saving for something that's, you know, five years down the road or one year down the road, and they want that invested a little less aggressive, um, a little more conservatively. So you can mix and match those different investment options. And you do not have to do the investing part, is that correct? Correct. We kept it simple. There are, um, like we said, six investment options, and they're just basically labeled aggressive um, down to conservative. Um, and it's just really how much you have in the stock versus bond market on each of those. So 100% stock to 100% bond with some options in the middle. I shouldn't okay. say 100% bond, 100% bond or cash. Yeah. Okay. And I think you... Somewhat, I think we've answered this already, but if somebody does lose their Medicaid waiver, they are able to keep access to their funds in their IABLE account if they still have a disability. Correct. Yes. Yep. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay. And then can, I think we get this question every time too. Um, can the consumer save for a vacation for them and have one caregiver go with them? Oh, I love these questions because I'm <laughs> always going to dodge them as much as I can. <laughs> Um, so, um, again, I'm going to preface this with, um, with the caveat that we cannot give tax or legal advice. Um, and then I'm going to go back to, um, you know, when we talked about what a qualified, um, expense is, uh, sorry, I'm probably should just talk without, um, trying to find that. Um, just remember that it is about, um, it's a benefit them in maintaining or improving their health, independence, or quality of life. Um, so you just have to be true to that. That um, So there's a very big difference. That's why it's not easy to answer yes or no, because there's a big difference between, um, you know, maybe just wanting to take somebody with you um, or you need somebody to go, that's the only way you would be able to experience that vacation and that vacation would additionally improve your health independence or quality of life. So while I can't necessarily answer that, and I don't know, Alicia, if you have a different way to answer that, um, you know, it's really relying on that bucket and really being true to the spirit of that, that um, what the federal government was trying to to do with these qualified disability related expenses? I would answer the same way. Okay. Um, as a provider who is also a representative payee, is it possible for the provider to open an account for an individual receiving services? There isn't one person who is the rep payee to share their social security number or other identifying information. I may need you to read that again, unless. Okay. Yeah. Okay. As a provider who is also a representative payee, is it possible for the provider to open an account for an individual receiving services? There isn't one person who is rep payee to share their social security number or other identifying information. Okay. So, so the answer to the question of can a rep payee open an account, um, that's going to go back to that hierarchy that we talked about earlier. So um, that rep payee to be able to, to open that account would have to certify under the penalty of perjury that nobody in that list is either um, willing or able to open the account. So once, once you're able to certify that, then um, the rep payee uh, can open the account Alicia, I don't know off the top of my head, and I don't know if you know, um, if they have to provide a social security number or if I would assume at this point they do. We are hoping to, in the next couple of years, roll out what we call an entity type of enrollment, but Alicia, I don't, I, I would assume they'd I, have to give a, a social. I think they have to until, and hopefully we can get the entity um, rolled right. out, but 
right now they would have to, to my best of my knowledge. It, and I would encourage um, reaching out to the program directly, um, you know, on that, that very particular issue. Um, and we hope to, over the next year or so, be able to provide a little more guidance in, in ways that what we're calling it as entities um, can help manage accounts for more than, than one person. I, I assume that's kind of what um, the question is, that there might be a an organization that is actually managing accounts for, you know, five or six or even more than that individuals. At, at this time, it's a little more complicated. The RET payees just came into existence for us um, um, on March 31st. So that was kind of the, the first, <laughs> the first, um, the first kind of barrier to break down. But, but then we've got more barriers in terms of our record keeping system breakdown to allow for that. And um, uh, Sarah Schneider with DHS did um, put in the, the link to the Medicaid estate recovery um, depth or ex explanation. So that is there for people that have more questions about that. We do have a few questions about the sibling successor. And if you could explain a little bit more about how the sibling ex successor works and if that person has to have a qualified disability. Yes, and I, I did mention that a little prematurely, so th that is not in place just yet, but yes, they would have to qualify for the program. Um, so while the federal government, when they made that change, was trying to allow for the idea or the concept of a successor beneficiary, um, we have that restricted to a sibling, but that sibling does have to have a qualifying disability um, that would, would allow them to um, have an IABLE account. They'd have to be able to open an IABLE account. Um, okay. And, and I want to on that, just confirm that it, it's, it will go live, that feature will go live in November. I, I'm sorry, Lisa, I didn't hear that all the way. Oh, sorry. We'll be rolling, we'll be implementing that, naming that successor beneficiary in November. Oh, okay, okay. Um, and so uh, some questions still around that. So if there is no sibling survivor or no beneficiary, what happens to the funds upon death of the, of the owner? They actually, they would go to the estate of the owner. So, okay. so there is no ability to name a, a beneficiary per se. Um, so they would okay. go to the estate um, and then be distributed through the estate. Okay. I do want to tell Sarah, thank you um, for sharing that link. Um, uh, for everybody and we'll make sure that's included with the information when we send out the, the information. Yes. So I'm just, looks like we've, it's making, going over some of the questions you've already answered. Okay, so just another clarifying question on the 100,000, not the 10,000 that I <laughs> talked about earlier, but um, could, can you go over that 100,000 but then anything over it would be counted as a resource for SSI Medicaid purposes, or that's just the limit, period. So 100,000 is the limit that you can have in, um, in an ABLE program, just, just to, to make sure, just to overcomplicate things a little bit. You know, the, the, currently you can save up to $2,000 outside of ABLE. So theoretically you would have, you know, 102,000 that you could have, but, but once your account and Alicia, I don't know off the top of my head. Um, uh, I mean, we, we want people to monitor and we're going to make sure that we're communicating with people when we see their accounts getting close to that hundred thousand, but, but they cannot go over. You, you wouldn't want to go over. Yeah. Can I clarify and correct me if I'm wrong? It was my understanding that they can go over. It's just not go over that 102 for SSI. For Medicaid, they can have, you can have more in the account. You can save more than 100,000. That's true. That is the limit for SSI, correct? SSI. So for Medicaid, you can have above the limit. And I believe our, the most you can have an IABLE account is 420,000. Yes, it, yeah, it is the same limit that is for the 529 plan. So thank you for that, Alicia. Yeah. Here's a, a different question that I don't think that I, I think we've talked about before, but if an account owner loses their job, can their 401k retirement account funds be rolled into an IABLE account? Well, I don't, you know, the, the federal government allowed, I'm not going to give tax advice, but I'm going to say they specifically allowed for 529 plans to roll over without penalty. Um, there is no similar um, 
to my knowledge, allowance. So if you, there is no way to roll that without tax consequences, if you took a withdrawal, you know, it doesn't matter where the money comes from in terms of able, but, but I assume by wanting to roll it over, you're wanting to not get the, the consequences, the tax consequences of an early withdrawal from an um, investment, from a retirement investment. And to my knowledge, I don't believe that there is that ability. Um, and then we do have some questions, I think, still about notifying DHS when the account owner, when, when an account is opened and show a proof of the account amounts. But I think what, what we're, we've been saying here is that the account is not considered a resource yeah. for Medicaid. Correct. I did a little bit of research really quick. So I thought this okay. question was like hitting me in the head that I had it. Before. I think I've heard, I've heard the um, question before. Yeah. Yeah, so we have worked with reaching out to um, some Medicaid offices and working to update some of their guidelines to not have it. Um, I know some of the, it takes some time sometimes to get some of the implementation after laws change. So prior to that um, house file, Karen, you're going to have to help me on the number. 835. <laughs> prior to the Iowa law change. Yes, prior to the law change, they did need to report it. But from our understanding, when I've spoken to um, members of DHS, they are not, they don't need to require it anymore. It's just working to get that updated throughout um, all their different branches. Okay, okay. Um, let's see here. But I do encourage you to reach out if you, if you have additional questions, it, um, reach out to the plan and we can work with you as well. Um, Couple more questions here. It doesn't look like what we've answered yet. Um, if you guys still are available for a little bit longer, um, can you define what long-term care service and support means in regards to IABLE? I I think that is that that's what somebody was asking. Yes, I assume that was related to Medicaid um, recapture. I'm um, I'm I'm going to punt on that one because we are not Medicaid experts. Yeah. So um, I I you know we this this slide is in there as a courtesy, but um, and it's what's in our program material. But we would really encourage someone to talk to your income maintenance um, uh, worker to get more information on exactly what that means, or work directly with. Um, Department of Human Services, um, Medicaid okay. Enterprise. Just another eligibility question, just to confirm if diagnosed prior to 26, but not found disabled by SSI until after, are they still eligible to open an account? I, I think I need to hear that one more time unless you caught that, Alicia. Yeah. Oh, I, I can repeat it one more time. If diagnosed prior to 26, but not found disabled by SSI, because sometimes that takes a little bit longer for that determination, oh, what I'm assuming. It's, right. It's based, it is based on, um, on when the onset of the, the disability. So not when you became eligible for SSI, but basically the onset of the disability. So if you were diagnosed at age 25 um, and you didn't, um, get that social security set up until 26, um, it's, you would still be eligible because that disability was present in, in, at age 25. I think that answers it. I, I think okay, you yeah. answered it. Um. I'm not sure, this is the back to the child support question. I'm not sure if, if, if you can answer this or if this needs to go back to a, a, an SSI or tax question, but I'll put it out there. If child, if child support is, is counted towards the 16K and not under work income, um, they do increase the SSI amount because of child support. So if I have an IABLE account and have the child support deposited to it, then her SSI amount will be increased to go back to the maximum. I can take that, Karen. Okay, <laughs> think, thank you. I think I read it at the same time as Brooke was saying. So, uh, I, my understanding, and I am not I'm not the one who manages the SSI, but my understanding in that instance would be because it was a over that threshold of the two thousand dollars in the account. So, if it was in an able account, it would not be counted towards that asset limit for SSI up to that sixteen thousand dollars. 
Um, can you transfer then the IABLE account back to a trust down the road? Um, can you transfer from an ABLE account to a special needs trust? Alicia, do you know that off the top of your head? Well, I'm going to go to Karen's. Uh, we cannot give uh, tax legal yeah. advice, <laughs> but if it's <laughs> going to better for, qual I mean, if it's a qualified disability expense, you would just need, I mean, if, you, if it is going to better the life of that individual with a disability, it can be considered a qualified disability expense, but I definitely encourage you to reach out to your tax or legal professional about your specific um, accounts. Okay. And um, a question about a brochure to share with families. And I think that information is on your guys's website. One of the, one of the things we didn't um, specifically share though, is that there is a program called you promise. Um, I'm sorry. I just said you promise you gift um, a program called you gift that is available. So that is a way that friends and family can make contributions um, without having to have it go through the account owner. And that information would be available on our website. It looks like um, it's a question about buying bedroom furniture, um, but I assume furnishing a, a, a community living situation would be considered an expense. I'll let you say that, Brooke, because I'm not allowed to say what okay. is or isn't an expense. I'm not either, I guess. But I, uh, <laughs> no, I'm just, I'm just joking in case our attorneys are listening. Yeah. Um, but, um, but I, you, you can know, blame again, it on the DD council. <laughs> <laughs> no, we just, we go back to, you know, if, if that is something that, that, you know, improves the, the, um, you know, the life of the individual and um, some could make an assumption that a bed certainly um, does that. <laughs> so. One more question I don't think we touched on about contributions. If someone other than the account manager wants to contribute, can they send the check directly to IABLE or do they have to send it to the account manager? Alicia, I'll correct me if I if I say something incorrect, but they can send it directly. They just they do need to know the account number. They they need to be able to identify that contribution so that so that we know where which account to put it in because we wouldn't we wouldn't have any of their information on hand. And we do always encourage to just coordinate with the account owner, whoever's managing yes. the account, if the account owner isn't able, because to make sure they don't go over that $16,000 limit, or it will be, we wouldn't be able to accept it. If multiple people are making contributions at once is an instance I could think of. Okay, I think we've covered all of the questions. Oh, one more, just real quick. Do you know if other states also allow for the tax deductions as well, or like if grandparents live in another state? So we would encourage them to look at their state law. For example, here in Iowa, that deduction is only available for Iowa taxpayers making a contribution to the IABLE program. So you have to be an Iowa taxpayer and you have to be making the contribution to Iowa's plan. So if you were making a contribution to an Illinois um, account, uh, you know, an Iowan could not take a tax deduction for that. Some states have what we call, um, you know, reciprocity with their, their tax um, benefits. Um, I'm not aware of which states those are specifically. So um, you would have to go look at that particular state and, and determine what their, what their state tax benefits are. Some, some, you know, state, some states don't even have tax benefits because they don't, they don't have an income tax, so they can't provide a tax benefit. So it's really dependent on the state in which that individual, you know, files their taxes to determine whether or not they could contribute to any plan um, or, um, and, and take that as whatever their tax benefit would be. Our, Iowa's tax benefit is unique to Iowa taxpayers. All right, I think that's it. Um, I, I do, we did have some questions about sharing the presentation. So we, we will be sent sharing out the recording once we get that done. I think we've well, answered all the questions. I just want to say, I want to give a shout out to the, uh, to Brooke and her team um, for putting this together and allowing us to, um, you know, really have a venue to, to, 
to provide information about this program to everybody and encourage everybody to reach out either to our program or the DD Council um, if, if you have any questions. Again, our goal was to break down those barriers and um, hopefully we have done that. So thank you for the opportunity. You are welcome. It's always great to partner with you guys. All right. But I think we'll let everybody go back to their evening. All right, thank you. Thanks everyone. Thanks for joining us.